Well, good morning, Spring Hill. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. We're going to be in Mark chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 30 here in just a minute. I was thinking as Carson had to deal with a broken string today, I was trying to figure out how many times I've, I've played guitar and, and led worship in my life, and I'm guessing a thousand-ish, and that's happened to me about five times, I think. So today is a special day, but I have had um, a myriad of uh, stress dreams where that happens to me. So that's like the Saturday night before the worship service stress dream is, you know, you get up here and, you know, you don't have the right clothes on or whatever, or maybe you don't know the songs or your string breaks, or as I've had to happen several times, my guitar falls right off me. Some of you guys in the band maybe remember that. So uh, I've had those stress dreams. I've also had recurring dreams uh, that are good. Usually it seems like maybe this is your experience or maybe I need some psychotherapy, but it seems like usually the stress uh, or the recurring dreams I have are bad. But I have had one good recurring uh, dream, and it's where I'll go to a concert, so back to the music piece, and I'm there and usually about the third, third row, something like that close enough where the band can see me, and they look out during the concert, and they realize, we need this guy on stage right away. <laughs> so they invite me up, whether it's some rock band or whatever it might be, they invite me up, and I come up, and I'm like, I mean, if you really want me to play, I'll put on a guitar, and I'll play. So I put on a guitar, and I play. And that's my, my exciting recurring dream. Uh, it's never actually happened in real life to me, uh, but it has happened to a few people, sort of. Um, you may have heard some classic rock bands in the past couple of decades as lead singers have died or gone on to something else. They've hired people off the internet, which I think is amazing. Um, so maybe the most famous one is uh, Arnel Pineda. He's the guy that sings for Journey now. And he's a Filipino guy that uh, the, the lead guitar player of Journey saw his videos on YouTube, I'm assuming. I don't remember how long ago this was, but somehow on the internet he saw his videos and they call this guy and invite him to come be the lead singer of a world famous classic rock band. How awesome is that? Uh, there's a guy that now sings lead for, I don't know if they still see or not, but the band Boston, a classic rock band, more than a feeling. Um, and this guy, you can tell how old this one is, uh, he sent, after the band's lead singer died, he sent them his videos of him singing the songs on MySpace. <laughs> Anybody remember MySpace? For our kids in the room, that's like uh, bef maybe before Facebook. It's what we did back when I was in high school, and you all had a MySpace, and that was your thing. So he became the lead singer. And what's awesome about both these guys is they stepped into a band that was already successful. Because most band stories is we start out in a garage, we work our way up, we finally get signed, we struggle for a few years, we make it, we hope it's not just a one-hit wonder, and, and there's this climb, but these guys got to step right in when everything was already good. They already got to step right in, first concerts to thousands and thousands of people. And I, I think that's a really neat idea to imagine what it would be like to step into something that's already really successful. But this is actually what, in some ways, Jesus' disciples get to do in his ministry. They show up, they say yes to following him, and fairly quickly within their following Jesus, he thrusts them in to his success. In fact, at the beginning of Mark chapter 6, what you will see, we won't go over this passage, but Jesus actually sends the 12 out to do the exact same things he has been doing. Not only do they get to go out and preach, they get to go out and heal people, which is pretty cool. And they're casting out demons. I mean, talk about a resume right there. We, uh, one time I healed. Five times I cast out a demon from someone. So they actually get to go in and join the work that Jesus is doing. You can check out a quick little summary in Mark chapter 6, verse 13. And then weirdly enough, Mark decides, for whatever reason, to insert a story that happened well before these events. And it's the story of the death of John the Baptist at the hands of Herod Antipas. So we'll... We'll come up with some theories of why Mark might have done that. And then where we're going to pick up today, the disciples are going to regroup and experience something really cool that they get to step right into in the ministry of Jesus. So we're going to re-examine a pretty well-known story, but what I hope to do together today is to look at the details and see what we might learn about joining Jesus in his ministry. 
So we're going to read in in sections here and then talk about it. We will start in verse 30 of Mark chapter 6. Again, this is right after uh, the story about Herod the Great, or not, it's not Herod the Great, it's his son, Herod Antipas, um, and the beheading of John the Baptist. Here's what verse 30 says. I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Bible here. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away by yourselves to a remote place and rest for a while. For many people were coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. That's how you know they weren't Baptists, because they would have found the time. Verse 32, so they went away in the boat by themselves to a remote place, but many people saw them leaving and recognized them, and they ran on foot from all the towns, and they arrived ahead of them. Verse 34, when he went to shore, Jesus, he saw a large crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then he began to teach them many things. So what we have here, I'm going to break this story into scenes or acts if you think of uh, sort of a play type structure. We have three different scenes going on here. The first one that we just read is the scene that represents the need. This is the need. So Jesus, in this early part of the story, what he wants to do is take his 12 disciples away from the crowds. They want to get away. He wants to get them to a remote place where they can rest, they can relax, they can recharge. And I love this about Jesus because it's not like Jesus is some divine slave driver who only sees human value in what we can produce for him. Right? Even in his disciples, he could have worked them to the bone and he would have had the right to do so. And yet what he chooses to do after this strenuous period of ministry is get away which makes perfect sense. Our pastor is doing that even at this moment. He wants him to get away because the crowds in Mark's gospel almost function like another character in the story. The crowds are a nuisance. They are a problem. I think back, if you're, you know, we're alive in the 90s and you remember seeing the videos of crowds that would flock around Michael Jackson and you'd have these teenage girls and they're literally fainting, they're weeping when they see just like his car drive by. I mean, it, it stops traffic everywhere. This is kind of what the crowds are like in Mark's gospel. In fact, leading up to our story, we have several places where the crowds are described negatively. So just listen to these for a second. All the way back in chapter one, haven't even got to chapter two yet. In chapter one, Jesus is hiding from the crowds in verse 37. He's trying to get away from them. In verse 45, the crowds actually force Jesus into the wilderness. He can no longer come into a town and do his ministry. Now he has to go out to the deserted places where no one is because the crowds are so obnoxious. You're probably familiar with the story in Mark chapter two of a paralyzed man who's carried on a mat by four friends. And do you remember why they have to go up on the roof and take apart the roof and lower this man down? Because the people won't let him in. There's such a mess of a throng of people, they can't even get into the house. The crowds are obnoxious. In chapter three, verse nine, Jesus takes a boat to avoid being crowded. He's trying to get away. In chapter three, verse 20, the crowd prevents Jesus from even getting a bite to eat. And then right before this chapter, in chapter 5, verse 24, if you remember the story of the bleeding woman, uh, she touches him and Jesus says, who touched me? And the disciples' response is, hey, everyone's touching you. Like, this crowd is insane. They're all over you. How could you even say who's touching me? Because everyone is. So in Mark's gospel, he doesn't equate crowds with success like we tend to. In fact, the crowds are obnoxious. And if you've ever opened your inbox, your email inbox on a Monday morning and you've seen a long list of emails of people who need something from you and you just groan a little bit inside and decide to go home and go back to bed, you understand what it's like to have an obnoxious crowd following you. And yet, and yet when Jesus looks out at this crowd, he sees through the madness to the heart of the real need. And the need for these people is a shepherd. Jesus says, or at least Mark describes it as, Jesus sees that they are sheep without a shepherd. Now, as you read that, I think hopefully the question we ask is, what in the world does that mean? Like, in what way are they sheep? Why do they need a shepherd? What's going on here? And there are several passages in the Old Testament that talk about being sheep without a shepherd. But I think... 
probably what Mark has in mind, what Jesus had in mind, is a passage from Ezekiel chapter 34. So keep your finger in Mark 6 and flip over to Ezekiel chapter 34. And what we're going to find is this prophetic passage from Ezekiel, God speaking through this prophet, is actually a critique of the leadership in Israel. And oh, by the way, what was our story right before this about? A really, really bad governor named Herod Antipas, who does terrible things. In fact, uh, one of the things that we see taking place is Herod is off eating with his buddies, and they have this really wicked banquet, and then it ends with John the Baptist's head on a platter. I mean, talk about some makes you want, not want to eat again. I feel like the next time I was at Herod's party, I'd be like, is this the platter? Like, I feel like I've seen this platter before. This isn't the one the guy's head was on, right? So pick back up in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 14. God is critiquing the shepherds of Israel, the leadership, for not leading his people well. But here's what God promises, and I'm just giving you a section. I encourage you after uh, this is over, go back and read all of Ezekiel chapter 34. It's rich all the way through. But let's pick up in verse 14. Here's what God says through Ezekiel. He says, I will tend them, my people, in good pasture. So pause for a second. How would you describe, what what image comes to your mind when you think of good pasture? Probably a rolling hill with green grass on it, right? So if that's the case, file that away in the back of your mind, and we'll come back to that. So back again to verse 14, Ezekiel 34. I will tend them in good pasture, and their grazing place will be on Israel's lofty mountains. There they will lie down in a good grazing place. They will feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will tend my flock and let them lie down. This is the declaration of the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the strays, bandage the injured, and strengthen the weak. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will shepherd them with justice. This is God's promise to his people. No longer is God going to allow these wicked leaders to come in and abuse his people. In fact, earlier in Ezekiel, it talks about the shepherds as if they're eating their own sheep to fatten themselves up. And these people, ultimately, they're, they're like sheep without a shepherd. They don't have the leader that they need. They don't have good leadership. And so I think when Jesus looks out and he sees people and they're like sheep without a shepherd, they need God to show up. They need God to show up and start leading his people again, to take control, to kick out all the wickedness, to deal with those bad guys, and to lead his people with grace. And so what does Jesus do here? Well, we don't get right to the miracle. In fact, what Jesus spends who knows how much time doing is teaching his people. That's what the shepherd does. He comes to his people and he speaks truth to them. And we don't know what Jesus said. I wish Mark would have recorded the whole lesson and would have given us a few chapters of you know, the sermon before the feeding or something. But we don't have it, but I just wonder if Jesus taught them Ezekiel 34 and he told them, The good shepherd's here. I'm here. And I'm going to lead you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to seek the lost. I'm going to bring back the strays. I'm going to bandage the injured. I'm going to strengthen the weak. And I'll deal with those fat cats who think they can get away with whatever they want to do. So Jesus teaches the crowd, and this is going to bring us to our second scene. So let's pick back up in Mark chapter 6, verse 35. Mark writes, when it grew late, his disciples approached him, Jesus, and said, this place is deserted and it's already late. Send them away so that they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. You give them something to eat, he responded. They said to him, should we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? He asked them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then he instructed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. So if our first scene addresses the need, our second scene addresses the preparation. This is the preparation for the miracle that's going to come. Now, we're going to walk through this, and and here's what I'm going to confess to you. I kind of get what the disciples are saying. 
What they're saying makes sense to me. In fact, in verse 35, they come to Jesus with what I would describe as a really sensible plan. I mean, you could almost say the disciples are being very thoughtful here. They could have not thought about the crowd at all. But instead, they come to Jesus and they're like, hey, we've been thinking. You know, we're out here. There's not a whole lot going on. There's no towns nearby. So let's go ahead and dismiss on time, pastor, preacher. Let's dismiss on time. Let's send them out so they can go and they can buy themselves some food. That's a really reasonable plan. It makes good sense. It's logistical. It's logical all the way through. And so I'm guessing what the disciples were expecting was a attaboy. Good job, guys. Thank you for thinking ahead. I am just just round of applause for you all for preparing in this moment. Very, very good job. And what does Jesus say? Well, of course, he's going to give them three commands. So I want to dig in with these commands for just a moment. The first command is this. No, you feed them. You feed them. Take care of the issue. And, And I read that and I think, didn't Jesus mean, like, shouldn't Jesus have said, Guys, I'll take care of this. I will feed them. I will provide food. Listen, I'm going to break bread. It's going to be almost magical seeming. I'm going to pass it out. It's going to be fine. That's not what Jesus says. He just looks at them and he says, you know what, guys? You take care of it. You feed them. You take care of the issue. And so the the 12 come back. And once again, I completely understand where they're coming from. They're going to raise a logistical issue. Hey, it's going to cost 200 denarii. Your translation may uh, translate that for you to some amount of pay. Basically, a, a denarius is one day's wage. So I did the math just because I need to do this to help myself understand things. Based on the workload or the work schedule of a Jewish person six days a week, uh, you're talking about eight months pay. All right. So I looked up what's the average Missouri salary, and uh, according to the internet, it's $54,000. So eight months pay would be $36,600, just to try to put some type of number on it to help us understand what they're saying. Now, I don't know if the disciples had this kind of money, possibly from all their collections. They did, or maybe they didn't, and it's just a, this is nuts. But either way, they look out at this crowd and they think, you know what this is going to take to do what you've just asked us to do? $36,000. It's a lot of money. So you're telling us to collect this money and then, I mean, we haven't even gotten to the logistics of how are we then going to go into town? Where am I going to find $36,000 worth of food? How are we going to haul it all back? There's tons of problems with what Jesus just told them. And so how does Jesus respond in verse 38? Go see what you've got. Go see what you have. What food supplies do you actually have? Interesting to me, Jesus doesn't take the bait on the money question. Isn't that, do you ever feel frustrated with people when you read about their conversations with Jesus in the Bible? I always feel this way about the woman at the well. And it's like every time she asks a direct question, Jesus seems to go off this way with his answer. Well, it seems like what he's doing here. But then when you stop and think about it for a moment, can you just imagine if instead of multiplying bread and passing it out, if Jesus had multiplied money and passed it out? We'd have a really different faith. You know what I mean? We'd have people coming to church for a completely different kind of reason if Jesus was multiplying Benjamins and just passing them out everywhere. $100 $100 bills there. And once again, when we look at the task, we know that Jesus could have done this by himself. What does he need them to go check out what they've got in the lunch pail? I mean, he could do it himself. But instead, he issues a command to his 12 disciples and says, go check out. Go check it out. See what the scene is. What food do we have? Of course, they come back. They've got seven food items. Seven. Which Mark's just setting us up with this number to show us the magnitude of what Jesus is going to do. So little resulting in so much. So then we get our third command. This one seems a little more sensible. In verses 39 and 40, the disciples themselves are told to seat the people in groups. So now they get to be logistical. Finally, they get to make the pattern and organize the group. They get to set things right. But as I was reading through, there's a couple of interesting words that are used here uh, for the groups. They're they're not just standard words for groups. Uh, One of them actually is a word for parties. Like, 
Kimbrough, party of 50, your table's now ready, or Spring Hill, party of 100, come on in. So uh, parties is one of the words. The other word that uh, is used here in this section is the word for flower beds. He puts them in flower beds. Now, I don't want to make too much of this, okay? So I am a, a Bible guy. I don't want to overread this passage, but I will say this. In light of the fact that throughout Mark's gospel, he keeps presenting the crowds as a nuisance. I think it's meaningful that in this particular moment, Mark presents this group, this crowd of what we know is going to be 5,000 men like a field full of flowers. There's a certain beauty to it. It's not just a bunch of cattle. I mean, have you ever been to a buffet and you just feel like a bunch of hungry mouths, a bunch of cattle, they're fattening up at the buffet? Anybody else had that experience? But it's not just a bunch, it's not a line of cattle going through and eating their stuff. No, this is a beautiful gathering of human beings who Jesus is gonna do something amazing for. So I think it's more than just, I put them in groups. There's something going on here. Maybe it's the fellowship. Maybe it is just the simple beauty of getting to eat a meal from Jesus. I don't know what it is, but one detail that I think is really important uh, is back in verse 39, because what were they sitting on? Green grass. Again, Mark could have just felt like telling a detail. It's possible. But on the other hand, if we reread Ezekiel 34, it seems like Mark's trying to tune us into the fact that God is fulfilling this promise. He's leading his people to green pastures. He's having them sit down and he's going to provide the good shepherd for these lost sheep. All right, so now it's time for the good stuff. Let's pick back up in verse 41. Mark says this, he, Jesus, took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and he broke the loaves. In the ancient world, you don't cut bread, you break bread. It's always the case. He kept giving them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. Everyone ate and was satisfied. They picked up 12 baskets full of pieces of bread and fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were 5,000 men. So we've seen the need of these people. We've looked at the preparation period, and now we get to the actual miracle in verses 41 through 44. And I just wonder, I think about Mark sitting down to write this event. Mark wasn't there. He wasn't one of the original disciples. He's getting stories from other people. Christian tradition tells us it's Peter. But I wonder as the 12 or the 11 uh, looked back on this event. During the course of their ministry, like what we see in the book of Acts, did they look back on the event and did they remember all these incredible things that Jesus did in this unique moment? Did they remember what it was like to depend on Jesus alone for more food to pass out? They didn't have it themselves. Did they remember how joyful the people were, not just to eat, but to be satisfied, to be full? Did they remember how even though they poured out over and over and they kept passing things out to thousands of people, they were never depleted because Jesus never ran out? Did they reflect on the kindness of Jesus, not just to do a miracle around them or next to them, but to actually include them, allow them to join in and participate in this amazing miracle that he did for thousands and thousands of people? Because I think when we read this passage, we can read it as a nice story about a miracle, but the question that comes to me is why didn't Jesus just do the miracle alone? Why not just do it himself? He has the power. No one's preventing him from being able to do this. And I think it's the same reason that Jesus sent out disciples earlier in this chapter to do his work. You see, Jesus doesn't just love doing miracles for people, even though he does. He loves doing amazing things in people's lives. Jesus doesn't merely like to show off his power and do a holy divine flex. Jesus loves to invite real, flawed confused human beings to join the miracle and to play a part. So we've looked at their story, and I know obviously we're not first century Jews running around with crowds of people chasing Jesus down, 
right? We have a different story. And even though our activity may look different, and I don't necessarily expect Jesus to multiply a bunch of food again in our lifetime, Jesus still invites us to join the miracles that he's doing all around us every single day. So in our application time, I want to look at the same scenes, but I want to look at them from our story instead of the story out of Mark chapter 6. So let's talk about the need today. I think this one doesn't need much explanation because if you ever look around at the world around us, there's a lot of need today. There's desperate need. And so the need today really is quite simply Jesus. It's Jesus for the lost. It's Jesus for the saved. It's Jesus for all of us. Uh, We can think about statistics. So I pulled out a few just to illustrate for you. Uh, There's a Pew Research data that came out that suggests those who identified themselves as Christian in 1950 was around 90%. Now, what does it mean to identify yourself as Christian? It's a whole other issue. But all that to say, in 2020, that number has dropped to 64% of Americans who will readily identify themselves as Christian in some capacity at all. We could talk about Bible engagement, how connected are people to Scripture. And this is one that's fascinating to me as as a Bible guy, uh, because... Before COVID, we had a 10-year consistent trend of about 50% of the population had some type of engagement with Scripture. For example, you sitting right here right now would be engagement with Scripture. Since COVID, that number has plummeted. I don't know why. I don't have the answers. But it's gone down to 39% over, once again, a 10-year average. So if you thought COVID was going to be some great savior and push everyone to Jesus, it hasn't played out that way. We could talk about SBC data that shows that seven out of 10 youth group attendees will stop attending church by the time they graduate college. And just anecdotally, if I go back to my youth group, which was amazing and I had an amazing experience, that data certainly stands true. And we're not even talking about the Christian deconstruction movement, if you're familiar with that, where my age group is coming and going, all this stuff that happened wasn't real or whatever. We haven't even moved out of America to worldwide issues. So all that to say, I think we're aware, I don't need to beat this down, that there are needs today. And so what's the solution? Because if I'm being honest, the way I wanna go with the solution is, I think we need better teaching on this subject, or I think we need a program that accomplishes this, or maybe you know those of us who have children, we need to go full Amish to make sure they don't run away from the church at some point in their life. But the solution actually is the very simple Sunday school, trite-seeming answer. The solution is Jesus. I don't know what else to say. Uh, Not very creative. Uh, The solution is Jesus. He is the good shepherd, and he's the good shepherd for unbelievers, and he is the good shepherd for believers alike, and we all need him to play that role. It's one of the reasons I love my Sunday school class so much is even the weeks where I get up and I'm the one teaching, uh, I have people in that class who are so good at bringing the most obscure things we're talking about back to Jesus. To say, well, I think this is how knowing Jesus actually impacts that very issue. And I love that, and we need that. I need that in my life. Let's talk then, if we know the need, let's talk about the preparation today. And once again, the answer is so simple, it's going to sound just like a a very trite statement. But the preparation that we need is the same preparation that the, the disciples had, and it's that they walked with Jesus. We could skip forward to the book of Acts where uh, the religious leaders are attacking the apostles and they say, man, what's the deal with these people? They're untrained, unschooled, ordinary guys. What's different about them? And the difference maker is they walk with Jesus. When we gather for life groups, I'm sure the the signups are coming here pretty soon. Our life group, by God's grace, we really strive to just be very open with our lives and so We just all give a prompt and we'll just talk through it uh, when we get together. And so one of my favorite prompts is something like, what's pushing you closer to Jesus right now and what's tempting you to be dragged away from him? In this moment, in this season of your life, what's pushing you closer? What's dragging you away? And it's such an important question. In my unique role as a college professor and a theology teacher, I have students and others come to me often. And what they'll say is, I know I'm supposed to do a quiet time. I've heard it my whole life. I know I'm supposed to go to church. I know I'm supposed to do all these things, but I really don't want to because I don't like it. 
So what am I supposed to do? Or maybe the question is simply, my quiet times are stale. It's just a chore to get through. What do I do about this? And I have two, two different answers. The first one is this reality that a lot of times the grass is greener in the valley than it is on top of the mountain. What I mean is, a lot of times we want to escape this valley, this dark place, this shadow of death, or frankly, maybe just this place of boredom. We want to get out of it, but actually, sometimes those are the places where God teaches us the most. I think maybe because it's when we're most desperate. We realize we actually need him. So don't discount the valleys, but on the other hand, what I encourage people to do is to think about their relationship with God a little bit differently. Because I'm afraid, and, and I've experienced this lifelong Baptist here, I'm afraid that we sometimes have this semi-masochistic, like punishment-oriented approach to our faith where we think, man, if I don't walk away feeling bad, or if this isn't horrible, or just straight up discipline that I don't wanna do, if it's not one of those things, then this must not really be of God. If you've ever felt that, can I just suggest to you that's silly. That's, that's not what we find in Scripture. God has designed our relationship with Him to be one where we enjoy Him. It's okay to smile sometimes, right? It's okay to, to be excited about something related to your faith. It doesn't have to be a mere chore all the time. So here's my advice to people I often give, is to find what pushes you closer to Jesus right now and run after it. Just go for it. If you're a music person, pray the words of your worship music as you listen to that. Let that be part of what it looks like to relate to God, to be with Jesus. If you're someone who you feel like you need to go so deep into Scripture all the time and go word by word, maybe you need to zoom out and read bigger chunks of Scripture. That's something I'm doing right now because I just got tired of going way too deep, and so I've been reading through 2 Kings and just hitting the big picture, and that's really been filling for me. Maybe you're someone who you've just tried to sit in a room by yourself and pray and you feel like you set a timer and I want to pray for five minutes and you pray your heart out and 45 seconds has gone by. Anybody else been there? So maybe you need to write out your prayers or maybe writing out your prayers has become stale. So guess what? Find another way to pray. Go on a prayer walk. It doesn't have to look the same for every one of us. Maybe you want to find a new insight each week to share with a friend because you think, man, am I supposed to just sit in a room by myself and that's the full sum of my faith? Yeah, no, that's not necessarily the way that God has designed it to work. So maybe the best way for you is to go, what has God taught me this week? And I want to share that with someone. I want to discuss it. I want to have a conversation with a human being because that's how God has wired me. And that's okay. Maybe you're relational and you feel alone. We, we hear the word disconnected all the time in church life and have forever. I just feel disconnected. I'm not connected with people. Maybe today's the day you look around this room, find someone you don't know and invite them to lunch. And you just say, hey, tell me your story. Because sometimes, at least for me, hearing someone's story provokes such worship in my life, even greater than some of these other disciplines that I feel obligated to do all the time in a certain way. Listen to sermons or insightful Christian books on Audible if you need to. Google a theological issue you're interested in and read up if you're a theologian in training. Here's my point. It's the sincere connection to Jesus that will allow you to pour out and pour out and still have baskets full of leftovers. Let's talk then finally about the miracle today. What does it look like? Here's my invitation to you. Find a miracle and join in. Jump into that rock band, jump on stage and start singing with them to concerts of thousands and thousands of people. Here's what I believe God continues to work miraculously in people all around us. Sometimes we may not have the eyes to see it though. But when you have the eyes to see and you're paying attention and you're looking for it and you see God working, jump on board, join in. When your neighbor expresses curiosity about the faith, Listen, ask questions. Start passing out the bread to that person. When your believing coworker is excited about something God taught her, take time and listen and rejoice with her and share her story. When your student who comes from a broken home acts out, you know, we've got to have a conversation today. Could that be the moment 
Could that be God beginning a miracle of need in this person's life? Will you pray for the compassion of Jesus to show them? And I believe this as well. Miracles are occurring at Spring Hill. They're hard to see sometimes, but miracles are occurring here. And if I'm being honest, they're occurring especially among our youth and our kids. And that's been true for a really long time. I haven't talked to Jess. I didn't talk to Tyler before this. I'm not, this is not me being a puppet for them at all. But let me tell you what makes a huge difference in these ministries is coworkers. And I chose that word intentionally, not warm bodies, not just reluctantly willing people, but coworkers that'll come alongside them and join arms and go, man, I see miracles taking place here. I wanna be a part of that. I don't wanna miss out on the miracles that God is doing here at Spring Hill. You think about opportunities that we have. We've got a new kids minister in Jess. We've got Tyler and Alicia got a baby coming real soon and life's gonna change. These are opportunities for us to step in and get to share those miracles that they've been seeing. I think about just the small things that we can rejoice in. My little guy, Cohen, just turned six. He's getting ready to start kindergarten. He's gonna leave Rich and Courtney's classroom here at church. I think they've had him two years. Is that right? Two years. They had Riley before that. And I can tell you in Cohen's little life and the way that he would express it in his own unique way that they have made a difference in his life. He's excited to come to church and to learn from him and he knows they care about him. And so the miracles that are taking place in him and we pray for him to come to faith one day, they have had a role to play in a very real miraculous event in the life of a child because they're willing and they're willing not just to show up but to invest and that's awesome. I think about Rob and Tal. Rob taught my Sunday school class for me today. Rob was my first small group leader back when I was probably a freshman in high school. He was my small group leader with a couple of other guys. Rob and Tal have taken me to Africa when I was 17 years old. Rob and Tal took me to Romania when I was 20 years old. In both of those trips, I was a punk kid. Wasn't I a punk kid? Can you nod with me that I was a punk kid? I was a long-haired punk kid who thought he knew everything, and through their willingness to be leaders in those experiences, God changed my life in really special and unique kinds of ways. So here's my point. These opportunities aren't about skill set. They're not about training, even though training is awesome. It's about a willingness to join the miracle God is already doing. And if you're wondering why the disciples got to participate in the feeding of the 5,000, it's because they had already said yes a lot. They had practiced the habit of saying yes to what Jesus called them to. Jesus can do every single one of these things alone, but he invites us to join in. It may seem overwhelming. It may seem impossible. It may leave us with a lot of questions, but the good shepherd is still in the business of feeding sheep. Will you join him? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you continue to work in our world today. And I, I just confess that sometimes I, I look at the darkness around me and it doesn't feel like you're moving or maybe that you're moving enough or in the way that I wish you would. But God, I know that you are. And I pray, God, for the courage and the willingness and the openness in my life and in the lives of my brothers and sisters here to just jump in. I pray, God, for uh, people today who have heard this and they're just sensing your spirit tug on their life to step out in a unique way. I pray, God, that if in this invitation it's time to whip out the phone and email someone or text them or find uh, an individual in this room, that you would give them the courage to do it and to step out and see what types of miracles they might join. And God, help us to see. Help us to look out and see the need and to know that you are moving. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for your goodness. God, all this for your glory. It's your name we pray. Amen.